This episode is brought to you by Indie Film Hustle TV, the world's first streaming service dedicated to filmmakers, screenwriters, and content creators. Learn more at IndieFilmHustle.tv. I'd like to welcome back to the show, returning champion, Naomi <laughs> McDougal-Jones. How are you doing, Naomi? I'm okay in I, quarantine, I like mean... us all. <laughs> yes, we... <laughs> but thank you for having me back. This is such a bright spot. It feels, it almost feels like life might be passing by normally right I, now. You know, it's it's one of the things I wanted to do while, while in quarantine. I told my audience... I'm going to keep putting out content. I'm going to keep, we'll, you know, we'll talk a little bit about what's going on in the world, but I, I need to keep, keep it normal. So there's some yeah. sort, something you could hold on to that yeah. makes you feel like it's something's normal because the show is, uh, a lot of people do listen to the show and it's part of their weekly routine. And if you take that away from it, it's just another thing that they don't have anymore, you know, yeah. or it, it kind of, it's another thing. So it, I'm, I'm making it my goal to kind of keep these things yeah. going. Not that I have anything else to do, obviously, because. <laughs> Aside uh, from wrangle your eight-year-olds. Yes, my my children. Oh, they're miracles <laughs> of life, aren't they? Um, <laughs> no, it, just for everyone listening, beforehand, I had a venting session with Naomi about the quarantine <laughs> and and what's going on here at the house. So uh, it's just, it's difficult. Anytime I do any interviews now, it's like, oh, look, an adult. Um, I get yeah. to talk to an adult without a mask on. So that's always nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. You never so nice know. to see your mouth move. Right, instead of just like yeah. Bane from Batman. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I was born into darkness, sorry. Um, okay, so <laughs> we brought you back on the show because you have a new book. But before we get into the new book, uh, your last episode, which was about your self-distribution journeys and adventures, uh, had, was one of the most downloaded episodes in the in in the history of the show, uh, and it was also put out in the Film Entrepreneur podcast as well. And people loved your story and loves your um, documentary series about your truthful raw documentary <laughs> series uh, on Indie Film Hustle TV about your journey and your self-distribution journeys. So. Can you give us an update? Because at the time you did that episode, you had just started getting numbers back from online, from TVOD and SVOD, and you seemed fairly depressed about that. Uh, yes. I want to see how... <laughs> so to continue with the raw truth, how, how yeah. has it gone with Bite Me? Well, so the, the TVOD numbers continue to be horrendous. I mm -hmm. think we've made about $1,800 so far but from iTunes, Amazon, and Google Play combined. And TVOD. In TVOD. Okay. We've made, um, I think, $5,500 from Seed and Spark because they're awesome oh. alone. Yeah, they pay and, like oh, obscene. They, they pay ridiculous amounts for ridiculous. their... But it's, like, don't ask questions. Just take the money. Take the money. Take I've, the yes, money. <laughs> yes, take the money. And smile. Um, so I think overall from the whole tour plus TVOD and everything and merchandise... From that whole episode of our journey, we made about fifty four thousand dollars. That's including that's including the 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 the, the trip around the country. Mm -hmm. And and TV, um, so that's every that's all the money you've made for the movie. All the money we've made so far, but in yes. a in a surprise twist ending. <laughs> <laughs> so so part of the thing that had caused us to go on the tour in the first place was the incredibly depressing conversations we were having with distributors the fall before we did the tour. Mm -hmm. Um. And where they were just going like, we love this movie, but we have no idea what to do with it. And you could just sort of feel the despondency wafting off of them. Mm -hmm. And we're like, we we can't, this is not <laughs> this is not a good way to distribute this movie. So then we did the tour and we collected all of this data about our audience. And we had all of these incredibly high click-through numbers from our Facebook ads. We have we had all of these people sign, come out in costume. We had, we had made this um, like audience reaction reel um, and that we cut together. And so then we went back to distributors and sales agents off the back of the tour and knowing that we needed to try to recoup more money in other ways. Mm -hmm. And we and we had six offers within two weeks of going back to them a year later after the tour. Was, is that with MGs or just offers to take it? Um, offers to take it. There weren't any MGs. But... Um, out of that, we got a sales agent. So, so out of that pool, we decided on a sales agent, Therese Linden Cohn from Talk Global Media, mm -hmm. who seems to be like one of the only honest sales agents in existence. Mm -hmm. uh, and 
we, we like really vetted her knowing what we knew by the end of the tour and like talked to old filmmakers that she had distributed films with. Almost every single one of them said they'd bring their film back to her for their next film. And we were like, OK. Um, so she took the film to Berlin to try to sell it um, internationally, which sort of melted into the coronavirus, but um, mm -hmm. seems to have a lot of offers in the pipeline. So we'll see. Well, we'll have to have you back. Because I want to know and where this goes. Actually, in a in an even bigger surprise twist, we've been invited to pitch the the move bite me as a TV series to a major network. Yes. Um. So we're working that's, on that pilot. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, because when I, when I, when I saw, it, I was like, this would make a great Netflix show or mm -hmm. you know a nice series. I mean, yeah. even if it's limited, even if it's a limited series. Um, because I don't think you could keep going with the same characters. It would have to. You have to create an entire world around it, and, and yeah, all this yeah, kind yeah. of stuff. But it seems it seems like it could do very well for uh, uh, yeah, for a nice stream series. Yeah, and also people kept asking us if there was going to be a sequel, and I was like, no. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> it's like a sequel but to I When Harry Met Sally. Like, I don't understand. <laughs> like, I don't understand. <laughs> but but I but I think what that means is that it was just characters in a world that people really wanted to spend more time in so that seems to suggest that it would do really well as a series and it is unique it's a unique it's yeah. a unique world it's not a world that i've seen very much uh, on screen before and there's definitely a niche audience um that's yeah. interested in that world um, with so well good so it's it's a long play this movie is a, a long lo play <laughs> it's a long this is not a short uh, dine and dash kind of situation <laughs> no. as far as the cash is concerned. Um, but it's a long yeah. play and you, you've learned a lot. What would you do differently? If you knew what you knew now, would you have made the move that movie for that budget, knowing the world that we are in as far as not, not the coronavirus, but just in general? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm not sure about the budget. I definitely, I would have, I would have still done the tour, mm -hmm. but I would have known how to do the tour more cheaply. Like if I, if I had the information I know I have now, mm -hmm. I know how to do the budget version of the tour because I know what worked and what didn't. And we were just, we had to like spend money on everything because we didn't know what would work sure. and what didn't. Uh, like, like yeah. everything. <laughs> like everything. Um, and so I would do that, but I wouldn't put the film on TVOD during the tour because that didn't end up amounting to that much cash. Mm -hmm. um, and then would have tried to find a creative distributor who was willing to sort of parlay the tour into more deals like immediately after the tour. Yeah, because uh, I, th I feel that th that also could do very well because of the genre, um, could do very well in physical media because the, mm -hmm. that audience loves physical media, DVDs, yeah. even old VHSs and things like that. Yeah. T-shirts, hats, all that kind of stuff yeah. uh, would do very well with that. It, it's, yeah, I always go back. I'm like, should I, what would I have done differently? So it's always yeah. nice. It's nice to do a postmortem, no pun intended. Um <laughs> <laughs> Vampire jokes are an endless well of humor. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it, it's very interesting, and you, and you've been so courageous to be so for, for you know forthcoming in um, the the warts and all experience of of the film and getting it out there. I'm really curious. Please keep me updated on where it goes if it gets sold internationally. And, and yeah, and because I was look, I sold my my like little micro budget film in five, four or five territories internationally, yeah. which easily covered the budget and then some. Uh, I was just yeah. like, it does, they do. Now in today's world, I don't know, which- I know, <laughs> this was all going, the, 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 the twist ending was all going very well and then coronavirus happened. So who knows what's so, going to happen. So but. that brings me to my next question. What do you think, or how do you think this industry is gonna move on, I, I, you know, after this massive change? Because yeah. it, it, it's, you know the the industry will grow. It will continue to go. It's yep. never it's never going to stop. It's it's no. very resilient, but the way it goes will be different. There is absolutely no question that things yep. will never be back to the way it was a month or two ago. Uh, yep. It just it just won't. Um, I'm curious just to hear your perspective on where do you think the industry is going to move in in general? Because I mean I just saw an article right now that AMC might not open up again. Yeah. Uh, and. And you know all these events are shutting down, and I mean not all shutting down. They're all gone. They're all shut down. Yeah. Uh, for and nobody knows what's going to happen. But 
you know, even the the experiment now, which people have been wanting Hollywood to do for a long time, which is to go direct to TVOD um, instead of going theatrical or do mm -hmm. a combination of the two day and day yeah. with some of these bigger titles. And they are doing it and people seem to be liking it. I don't know what the numbers are. I don't know what kind of revenue that's being generated, but it, it, it's a really interesting time <laughs> to be alive. I mean, for sure. I, I feel pretty excited about it from the perspective that you and I talk about and your audience thinks about, which is that a moment like this is ripe for some kind of new model. Yeah. And like we've been trying to force a new model anyway, but now people's behaviors have shifted. Um, I think um, also the fact that everyone's becoming used to lo-fi production value um, because they're watching Jimmy Fallon from his living room without all the lighting and they're watching, you know, oh, like John Oliver and, John Oliver, and, right, and, and Jimmy Kimmel, everybody. Yeah. And so I do wonder if it's going to kind of allow us to strip back to the essence of what matters about storytelling and allow us to make films more cheaply, but maybe not in a way that doesn't pay people, but just like, like, does it matter if you have, this insane production value, or is it the story that matters and the character that matters? And and we, but we've been kind of, we've been kind of going that direction uh, yeah. in general because the studios are not doing those smaller budget films. And when I say right. smaller budget, twenty million. I mean right. it's like they're they're you know Disney basically does all they do except for the occasional like Queen of whatever that 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 the African chess playing yeah, yeah, movie, yeah. which was great. Um, but they do that like once in a blue moon, or they do the Disney nature movies, which don't really count. Um, they're stuck <laughs> basically. They don't count in the sense of in the scope of yeah, the yeah, Disney right, world. We'll um, um, but they're stuck to doing studio films. And and, and when I say yeah. studio films, they're tentpole, 100 million plus. Don't even look at, don't even talk to me unless it's 100, 125 million. And yeah. there's an IP behind it. But that's where all the studios have gone already. So everything else has kind of gone lo-fi. But even then, look at television. I mean, look at Games right. of Thrones was tw with right. 12 million an episode or something right. like that. Yeah. I, I've but been also like, I don't know that that's sustainable long term either, particularly now that, you know, there's Disney Plus and all like the the, the profligation of platforms. I don't know that any one platform is going to be able to spend that much money on shows anymore. I well, that, that's the key too. that's the thing, because when you you pay for a ticket to a movie. You're, you're, you 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 make a product you sell that you sell the access to that product and that was the studio system for you know uh, over on almost 100 years and there was a revenue stream from that and then you can just from that one revenue stream then you can go to home video then you can break down the cable there's different windows to generate revenue from that thing where now that w the windows would be closed in the sense that like onward which was a Pixar Disney movie which was great by the way I saw it, I saw it like yesterday or two days ago with my kids that went straight to Disney Plus. Like they did the, mm -hmm. the experimental TVOD theatrical for like two weeks. And they just said, screw it. We're putting it on. And I was I was shocked. I was honestly shocked. Right. I did not expect it to go to Disney Plus. So, so wasn't quickly. that was related to the coronavirus, no? Oh, of course. Yeah. It was, yeah. It yeah, was yeah, yeah it's because it was being forced to go to the coronavirus right. because of the coronavirus. So it was shocking. And it did some money in the box office, but it wasn't in the box office for a long time. So it was it was really interesting. So I'm curious to see where Wonder Woman's going to show up, where Black Widow's going to show right. up, where James Bond is going to show up. Uh, these movies that are finished in the can, ready to rock, but they're like, do we release it? Right. They, we don't. Well, we don't how know. long are you going to wait? I mean, that's the point. Like, how long are you going to sit with a hundred, two hundred million dollar product on right. your shelf? Like, it's and like, and if you do release it, the like, is it a write off? Because are you going to generate four hundred million dollars? You can't. So that the, the new model is instead of windowing, you basically have the one window, which is your own platform. And it right. really is not about getting to a certain extent. Look, look what happened to Netflix. They got 150 million of us here. Um, there is some growth here in the United States, but not a lot. So that means you're basically now funneling money in just to keep the engine going, right. not right. to acquire, not to grow 
to maintain. Well, and, and from what I understand about their business model, that's why they're a little screwed right now because I think they've always borrowed against future growth in order to pay for the content right now. And like they're quickly approaching the point where every human on the planet who will ever have a Netflix subscription already has a Netflix subscription. So then what do they do? It's going to crater. It's going to crater. Exactly. So I've, I've been saying this for a long time too, that, that this, this golden age or this buying spree that everyone's spending all this obscene amounts of money on content. Um, it's going to, it's, it's, they can't, it can't, it's not sustainable. It's a bubble. No. It's a bubble within our industry. It's going to pop. Well, and it's going to pop because it relies on foreign markets buying our movies, which already, even in China, they're starting to go like, wait a minute, why are we watching all these movies about white people? <laughs> we can make our own movies about ourselves mm -hmm. and see those movies. And that's going to, like, the more and more that these audiences become sophisticated and watching these movies, that's going to happen all over the place. Right. And there's only the few studio movies that will, will penetrate, like, you know, like the Disney right. movies and the Universals and all the, the big the big tentpole things. And if you notice all those big tentpole films, all of a sudden have more Asian actors in it. Right. We have more of this. Act, have, <laughs> I mean, it's not like there was that. This is uh, not the, not my movie. This is Meg, the Meg, that big shark movie. It was so you know, that big. It was like a, the it was like basically Jaws. Every every like 10 years they put out a new Jaws. Yeah, yeah. But it's like a dinosaur version of Jaws. It was like this giant okay. thing. The whole movie was like like two or three Chinese characters. It was a Chinese company that was setting up the whole thing, but Jason Statham was in it. But it was just like so blatantly kowtowing right. to the Chinese market. It was just like, wow. Right, well, because, because domestic audiences hate their stuff now. So like they're like, and they know that and they don't care because they're making a billion dollars per movie overseas. But- it's, it's, as you say, it's not sustainable, but this is where I see there's such an opportunity Correct. for independent film. And, and the problem is that we haven't figured out the distribution revenue model and it keeps changing. And now there's coronavirus. <laughs> there's like, but, but if we could solve that mechanism for revenue and distribution, we should be able to step in and fill that void that Hollywood has left for grown up movies in the United States. Yeah, I, I do. I do agree with you 100%. I do think that I mean, I, we were saying it earlier, Rome is burning. Um, and uh, some people don't even realize they're like, hey, it's hot in here. What's going on? While a lot of us are <laughs> like, dude, do you not see that Rome yeah. is burning? And when I say Rome, right. it's Hollywood. So it's it's slowly starting to started to shake and certain things are starting to fall. And within before this is all said and done, there will be a lot of casualties. Uh, some of the studios will be acquired or or gone, acquired no one they're never going to go away right. they'll be acquired by some their libraries will be acquired by somebody else um but in the rubble is when the great new movements come out the great new opportunities come out and i mean it was in 2008 2009 when netflix started streaming right. and you know and look what happened then you know um it, there's a lot of things that are going to be changing in the coming weeks and months um I, I just there's such an unknown like we literally have no idea no, no fucking idea. nobody has any idea in are, are we're gonna have a summer season like am i gonna go to the I, theater i doubt it even if everyone says hey we're good corona's taken care of here's the <laughs> vaccine here's some treatments it's all good now it's just go down to yeah. your local cvs and get this little shot you'll be good as go, good as rain even with all of that, if that was all said, there's still going to be kind of this hangover yeah, that's left over. And I'm not going to go to the theaters. This, this, you know, I, yeah. I, I have kids, so I rarely went to the theaters anyway, because um, right. the cost. And, <laughs> right. and and that's a whole other conversation of how the the movie theater industry has basically been abusing us for the last <laughs> eighty years right. with their ridiculous pricing. And now it's people are like, oh, really? Well, you know, you really weren't that good to us now, but we're good now. We have these home systems. We don't need right. to do this. It's right. a shame. You were, yeah. you were overcharging us and making shit content for the last 10 years. Like, why Why are we coming out for you when we might get coronavirus? Exactly. So it, it, this might be the first summer since summer blockbusters became a thing in the 70s that we might not have a summer blockbuster. Did you? Yeah. I just read that the only pulse left in the theatrical box office is drive-ins. Maybe drive-ins will come back. Drive-ins are the silver lining. There is the only 
place that people are oh, going to go watch movies is drive-ins. I just saw a whole article about it. Like, because there's the week before it was like zero. It made like the, the whole box office made nothing. Then some drive-ins opened up again. And now people are going to drive-ins and people are like, well, yeah, I want to no. go to, th- I want to go out. I want to go, but I'll be in my car with my, with my date or my family. Genius. So now drive-ins are becoming a thing. And that I was like, again, isn't that insane? It's like, like vinyl is become a that thing. That would be now. so fun though. <laughs> it would, because <laughs> vinyl, vinyl now is outselling CDs for the first time is since the right? 80s. Yeah, it is true. I yeah. Vinyls that. outsell CDs now um, for the first time since the 80s. So wow. now drive-ins, can you imagine drive-ins are coming back? Maybe 8-track, who knows? It's coming back. Um, <laughs> we're just going backwards. We're just going backwards. Well, I think the, the other thing I think, so we, for my third feature, we're, we're, we're looking at an opportunity to turn it into a radio drama mm-hmm. during quarantine. Mm-hmm. First, with the idea of kind of like creating a pre-existing IP thing and building audience and testing the idea and all these things, I think that might become a viable model too. That'd be, that'd be, yeah. Well, I mean the whole, the whole, uh, you know, a radio drama is huge and has become a thing. I, I know a lot of authors who write um, fiction created their own podcasts to talk about their fiction. And, and sometimes they'll actually write for the, and, and then sell their books on there. So it's kind yeah. of like using the film entrepreneur model, like in the sense of creating content to sell ancillary product lines right. or services or things like that. Um, you have to start thinking outside the box, period. Yeah. I mean, that's the only way you're going to move forward. If you think, and I said that I just did a podcast about side hustles for filmmakers and screenwriters in the Corona era. And I said, look, if you guys believe that in three months, it's going to go back to where it was in January, you're out of your mind. You've yeah. got to think differently. And I'm still talking to directors and writers and people in the industry who who are, well, business is it's fine. So if it, we're, we're good. To, we're, everything's business as usual. It's a little bit of a downturn. It's kind of like the writer's strike. Everything kind of shut down. Mm-hmm. Like, no, guys, no, no. This this is not, this is going to really right. change. And, and I don't know if it's delusions or they're just uh, denying it to themselves. Like they just don't want well, to, they don't want to believe look- it. <laughs> I don't think they want to believe it because you and I outside of the system, we're like ready for this moment. We're like, we've been waiting for this. We've been preparing. We have the information. <laughs> like, like, where do we sign up for building the new model? But like, if you've invested oh, no. your whole career in Correct. a system that may just have collapsed under your feet, that is going to take some time to adjust to. It, that, psychologically, it's going to take a minute yeah. to, it, to adjust to. There's no question. I feel like, I feel like we're, uh, we're Rocky and Rocky won. Who've been kind of yeah. like training around, and someone's going, oh, the, the, <laughs> just kind of like, hey, Apollo just said you want a shot at the title. Like it's kind of <laughs> like, and and Apollo happens to be the Hollywood system, and we're just like, let's yeah. do this, let's let's yeah. get in. We've like, been we prepared. didn't even have to take them down. Coronavirus did it for us. <laughs> He's weakened. He's shaken. His <laughs> knees are shaking. We could take him out. Um, and, and look, guys, we joke. Look, there's there's hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of people who are affected by this in in our small industry. Um, and you know, uh, it's gonna, it's gonna change things. There's so many lives that are, who are, are, are reliant on the industry, on the system. Um, like every, like every business everywhere. Um, but regardless of that, you're going to have to, you know, whether you like it or not, you're going to have to change. Like Mike Tyson said, the great incomparable Mike Tyson said, we all have, everyone's got a plan to get punched in the face. And, mm. and we just got punched in the face. We, you and me, you and I have been taking punches for quite some time. <laughs> <laughs> so we're just like, like yeah. this, this is what, get this ready. is just a normal, this is, I mean, it's harder, it's stronger, it's different, yeah. but we've been being punched all day as far as our industry is concerned. Yeah. I've been thinking a lot about the analogy of forest fires as a natural part of the cycle of Mm -hmm. a forest and um, the fact that at a certain point in growth in a forest, some of the trees basically get too big and nothing can grow underneath them. And so in the natural um, cycle of things, a forest fire will happen and it will take down those bigger trees. And after that happens, it is the only time that new trees really stand a chance of of getting any sunlight and being able to grow. Oh. And I feel like we're, this is that moment. And like, yes, there's destruction and there's pain and there's suffering. And I don't want to minimize that, 
but it's also this unbelievable ch- opportunity for growth. I'm going to steal that um, yeah. 110% because I, I, when you said it, I knew exactly where you're going with it. And it's a great analogy um, because, and I think that's, I think that's the, in a lot of ways, there's a lot of industries like that. There's a lot of industries that are fat um, and bloated and leveraged uh, and they just kept, you know, doing their thing and thinking like the good times. It's like, it's, I swear to God, it's like the roaring twenties again. It's like, it's a great gas. <laughs> it's everything's going to be great forever. And, um, and, and now all of a sudden <laughs> the guys, we're, we're the ones outside the party. We've been knocking on the window for a while and the party's yeah. been going great inside, but now the party's down and then now they're coming out. They're like, where do we go? Oh, there's these yeah. guys that could have get to the party. Let's go <laughs> over there and see what they can do. Meanwhile, for they've been building a boat. <laughs> they've been building a boat. And we're in the ship. See you guys. <laughs> we're bye. Bye bye. <laughs> All right, we've gone off on, on, on a tangent a little bit, um, but I, I think it was important to kind of talk. I'd love to, I wanted to hear your opinion about it. Um, and and this kind of brings us into your new book called The Wrong Kind of Woman. So first of all, tell us a little bit about what this book is, right? Because obviously it's about um, an evil woman who uh, is hurting yeah, a man, who's obviously. trying to take all the men's jobs. Obviously. Obviously. <laughs> Um, (laughs) The book is called The Wrong Kind of Women, Mm -hmm. Inside Our Revolution to Dismantle the Gods of Hollywood. So actually, our last conversation was a perfect segue into this discussion. Um, So the book is about the fact that if you've watched primarily mainstream U.S. movies in your lifetime, 95% of all of those films you have ever seen were directed by men and overwhelmingly Mm -hmm. white men. Uh, 80 to 90% of all of the leading characters that you've ever seen on screen were men and overwhelmingly white men. And 55% of the time that you've seen a woman on screen, she was naked or scantily clad. And that has been true for most of the history of cinema and is still true, which is pretty mind boggling when you consider that women are now 50% of film school graduates. Um, Yeah. So like somewhere between women graduating films, what 50%, and only 5% of them directing studio films, a lot of careers are getting bled out. Um, so the book is, is a look at, the, at how that's happening. How is it mm-hmm. possible that that is still true in 2020? Um, what are the mechanisms by which those careers are being bled out? What is the impact that that's having on the brains of the people who are watching our content, that, that, um, that our content's coming almost exclusively from this monolith of the white male perspective. And it's not that it's a bad perspective. It's just that it's one perspective out of a whole spectrum of perspectives perspective. yeah. that is currently controlling 95% of our content. Um, and, and then the book is about solutions. Like, okay, what do we actually do about this? Because we've had 7,000 panels and discussions and the studios have sent out press release after press release saying, look, we've solved our woman problem and they never have. And it's like, okay, how do we actually fix this? Yeah, there's, um, you know, being a, I'm a Latino man and I have been uh, all my life. And <laughs> <laughs> you didn't choose that later. I didn't, I didn't choose that. No, I was born that. And, uh, you know, for, I remember growing up when I was uh, in the commercial business, I was doing commercial directing and I worked in Miami which was, uh, you know, obviously a very Latino area. And there was a lot of, you know, South American clients and things like that. I was told that I couldn't put Spanish uh, commercials on my reel because I would lose out for anything domestic. That's how Mm -hmm. ignorant it was. You know, this is before Guillermo del Toro, Robert Rodriguez, uh, you know, just on the Latino side. And of course, there's Spike and and John Singleton and all the other uh, great... um, uh, directors of color but i still i never forgot that i never forgot i was like yeah. wow it's just like why why can't i you know i'm, I'm not less right. of a director because i <laughs> i understand spanish or right. just because there's spanish character or next spanish speaking people on the screen does not mean <laughs> that i cannot direct english speaking people <laughs> right it's right. an it's an insanity well, and, and i would i would question whether that would be that different today even with those those it, examples it, it, that you cited. It is, it is, and it, it is, it is not to, uh, to, to a certain extent. If you are, because you have to understand, especially in the commercial world, but even in Hollywood, a little less in Hollywood, but more in, in the commercial world, uh, they want to put you in a box. You're the, the, yeah. the tabletop guy. You're the dialogue guy. You're the comedy guy. You're the, this director, that director. And you heard me say guy. 
uh, every time I said that, right? You hear me say, I never once met a female commercial director ever in my, in my whole journey as an editor, as a director, working with thousands of clients in the course of my career. I never once met a female, um, commercial director. I worked with many female uh, feature directors and, and television people, but never, um, never in the commercial world. Uh, and never in the music video world either. Not that they're not, I just never ran into them. So it was- And there it, aren't that many for sure. They're just not. And it's such a boys club. Um, it was an essentially a, you know, Anglo, Anglo boys club that it took a while for, uh, you know, Latinos to break through and African-Americans to break through and Asians to break through. Like it's a, it's, it's a difficult thing. Um, and I can only imagine for women because, you know, from my perspective, I, you know, I was raised by a woman obviously, uh, single, single mom, <laughs> single mom. And, uh, I have only daughters and I basically have no testosterone in my life. Um, especially nowadays, <laughs> so every time I, I, I talk to a guy We're locked in a house with three women, <laughs> I'm locked in a house with three women. And I think I, tell, I always tell them like, if we get a pet, <laughs> it's a boy. <laughs> I need some sort of testicles. <laughs> has that some sort of testicles? <laughs> I can't take this anymore, and I, I can only imagine what's going to be like in, when they're teenagers. I don't even want to think about these things right now. No, no, best not to think about it these days. Not these days, exactly. So uh, you know, I I've always I've always saw the problem, and I was dealing with my own problems of just trying to break through as a Latino director. Um, but what I saw when I saw your book and and I saw your TED talk by the way which which which, which was fantastic, mm -hmm. it was shocking but it wasn't shocking at all. Like right. the numbers that you just threw out are are just ridiculous. They're absolutely I mean, it, ridiculous. That's the thing. It's like it's so unreasonable. Like <laughs> it's like, not like it's like a forty seventy right. thirty. Like it's not right. like slightly. It's like five percent. It's like right. it's stupid. It's stupid. And just it's stupid. And and like just to put it in perspective. White men are about 30% of the U.S. population, mm -hmm. which means that the rest of us are 70% of the population. And again, it's not that it's a bad perspective. It's not that it's an invalid perspective. It's 100% valid 30% of the time. It's just that it's taking up 95% of, of the content and the space. Yeah, um, without without question, and I think I, I mean I do have I have to say there has been some change in the in the recent years ever since the the Me Too movement. I have seen change. It's not nearly enough in all scopes of life. Uh, it's it's got scopes of the job market, but I have seen more. Like when I watch television, I always watch who directed it, and I always yeah. want to see. And I and I have been seeing more female directors. Yes, but but can I give yeah, you please. some bad news about that? Sure, go ahead. So. Okay, so yes, and and this this is sort of this danger point that we're in because we ha we had me too. We had all of the articles we wrote, you know, Weinstein, all this, um, and 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 one of the things that we are seeing that is real change is there are more diverse characters on screen. So mm -hmm. we are seeing more stories about characters who aren't white men, which is good. Mm -hmm. The problem is that the numbers behind the camera, so the people telling the stories are changing almost not at all. And the reason that you feel like you're seeing more female directors is because there has been such an explosion of, of, of series content that there is just more of it overall. So it is Percentage. true that there are more women directing more shows, but the percentages have not changed barely at all. Got it. So it's just more As, opportunity, basically. There's more no, opportunity in, in the scope of all the opportunity to direct, all the period. So like, there's, there's more opportunity for you if you are seeking it out or if you tend to like that kind of content to find content, but in the, in the scope of what everyone is watching, it is still the same percentage. And, and I feel that, I, I, yeah, I, that makes that makes perfect sense. And look, I remember when, you know, one of my heroes growing up, Robert Rodriguez, showed up and he snuck in the door like he was he's completely snuck in. He was like the first major Latino director working with major budgets, doing doing what he was doing. Um, and, I, and I always tell people, regardless if you like his movies or not, you got to respect the man for how he does what he did um, and how he continues to do it. And then Guillermo and Alfonso and and um, what's his name? Oh, God. The other one. There's three of them. Um, in yes. Uh, in Iraq. Yeah. Yes. Um, they all they all came in and they just won every Oscar ever. I know. But OK, <laughs> but this is super interesting. So you're right. 
but they are all from foreign countries. Correct. So this is, They're not domestic. So this is super interesting because in this whole, um, like, and it was awesome that Parasite won. Yeah. Love the director. He's amazing. So great that it won. But uh, a lot of the, the Hollywood press was like, see, diversity is solved. But actually, <laughs> if you look at the last 10 Best Director Oscars, huh? nine of them went to foreign male directors, which is really interesting because, of course, they've they've never given um, the, the Best Dress Director Oscar to an African-American of either gender and only ever once given it to a woman which was Catherine Bigelow. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it brings up this sort of disturbing implication that the Academy is more willing to see greatness and empathize with the stories of men who live on the other side of the world than mm -hmm. with the women and the people of color beside them. Yeah. And, and that you're absolutely right. I've actually, when I was come when I was still chasing the, um, the Hollywood dream years ago, I was like, maybe I should make a feature in Spanish and um and and just you know submit it to some festivals as a foreign film uh right, you'd, have to, you'd have to like pretend that you were from spain or something I mean, not it, feel threatened by it, it was, it's weird it's a weird it's a weird thing but look this is this is a system that has been in place since um since edison started this whole thing you know uh, or the lumiere brothers technically or actually well, somebody else almost but mm -hmm. Do, did you know that during the silent film era, there were more women directors, writers, studio heads than at any time since then? So when did it switch and why did it switch? So it switched when talkies came around because before that it was considered basically an eccentric hobby. Like nobody really thought there was an industry there. Sure. And, and, the, and the men were sort of away fighting World War I and they were like, yeah, whatever, that's fine if the women are doing this. And there were actually more women and they were getting paid better than the men were in Hollywood. And then when the talkies came around and everyone was like, oh, shit, this is going to be a real thing. Wall Street came in and you can see in t contemporaneous documents, they said to the guys, they were like, OK, we'll invest in this. We'll build it into an industry, but you've got to get the women out, first of all, because they don't know how to run business, obviously. <laughs> and second of all, because they're making these really radical films about um, abortion and cross-dressing and lesbianism and, well, then this is, uh, and then we're talking about like the thirties, Jesus. Yes. Right. <laughs> so radical. They were making films that were sparking riots. They were getting, sh they were shutting down theaters. And so the wall street guys were like, we're going to have a real problem in society. If women around the country keep watching these movies and start getting all these ideas about what their lives should be like. So, so, um, so after an era where there were actually more women than men in these key positions in the industry, by 1945, they had so completely evicted the women that only one half of 1% of all films were directed by women between 1945 and 1979. One wow. half of 1%. Wall Street strikes again. Yes. Well, then, well, <laughs> then this, uh, this makes absolute perfect sense. I didn't know that. I had no idea about that. That's, yeah. it's, it's it's you know you know I, I've been I've been talking about the the sizzle and the steak that Hollywood has been selling people for the longest time the Hollywood dream. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the Hollywood dream that you were sold and we were sold together? Um, yeah. And and the ambitions to make it in the business and because I mean from my perspective I was sold you know when I went to film school, every every student was going to go to Hollywood and every student was going to be a studio yeah. director if they wanted to go into the directing side. And you were, you, it was, it's just, it's just, your just wait in line when Spielberg's not working, you could jump in. And yeah. that was, that was kind of the story they sold because that's how you got those kids in the door. Cause if you told the kids, Hey, this is really tough. And I came up in the 90s, which was a lot different than it is today, yeah. as far as opportunity, as far as competition, as far as anything. Um, if you told them the truth, they would never have a full classroom because it's like, who would want right. to jump into something? It's, it's insane like that. So when well, you, so for I want that's my perspective as a, as a Latino man. I would love to hear your perspective as a female filmmaker. What what was what what was the story that they, they sold you to even think that you could even do anything in, right. in the business? Well, one thing that they definitely never said was, <laughs> "Hey, your percentage is going to go down from fifty percent in film school to five percent of directing studio films." Like there was never any discussion about 
the, gen the gender disparity about what we would run into, about the sexism we would be up against, which I, I have been, um, since the book came out, really pushing it to, to film school professors and deans saying, like, you are doing a <laughs> great <luck. laughs> service. To your well, I hope, uh, I wish, I hope, I wish. Like, I would love them to, to have my, my book, the, the Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, but it completely shatters well, what they're selling. Well, I guess we've got to start our own film school then. But anyway. <laughs> that's another but, conversation. <laughs> that's another conversation. But um, but the point being, like, so so I, I interviewed over 100 women, and mostly women, but some men also for this book, and, and asked them about their experiences too. Like, what did you expect leaving film school or acting school or whatever? And then what happened? And yeah, like I watched the Oscars every year from the time I was six years old in my pajamas. And there was like, I, I bought the myth hook, line and sinker. And I, it never occurred to me that it wasn't a meritocracy, right? Which was idiotic and naive, but, mm -hmm. but it certainly never occurred to me that unless you were a white man, you basically had no chance or like a ridiculously small chance. Um, and so what I what I noticed in interviewing all these women for the book is that basically everybody goes through the same cycle. They they go to film school, like raring to go, confident in their voice as a storyteller. Film school slowly starts eroding that, right? Because all of the films that are taught are here is what great cinema is, and it's all by and about white dudes. Mm -hmm. And so it's like slowly this messaging begins that your perspective doesn't matter, that films that resonate with you aren't great. Um, and then, and then you get out into the industry, you face all of this sexism, all of this racism, and um, you you think, but but you you don't compute that that's what it is because nobody ever told you that that would happen. So then you go through this ten year period of blaming yourself, trying to make yourself into something that they will pick, mm -hmm. um, shaving pieces off of yourself, mm -hmm. and then eventually maybe getting to the point of understanding what you're up against actually and then maybe 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 beginning to think about finding ways around it but but if you could just if you could just like have them read my book or a book or something and be like hey here's the deal this is so unfair but this is what's true mm -hmm. here's what you're gonna face here are the things people are gonna say to you and here are some tools to think about how to get around it you would save them decades of despair right up front this is what I, this is basically my, my mission in life <laughs> with what no, I do. I know it is. Yeah. I, it's, it's, I, I but, try. But it's, but, it, but, but it's interesting how those two conversations tie together. Like this isn't unrelated from what we were talking about in the first half of the episode, because it, it's all the same myth, right? Like it's also the myth that you have to wait for the system to choose you. Well, if you're waiting for the system to choose you and you are not a white man, you are going to be waiting a very, 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 very long time and probably never have a career. So the the necessity of building new systems and finding ways around and being a film entrepreneur for people who are not white men is even more important. Mm -hmm. Without without question, I was mentoring um, uh, a friend of mine has a daughter here in uh, in in L.A. and she just got out of film school. And, you know, she was a fan of mine and everything. She's like, do you mind talking to her? I'm like, do you really want me to talk to her? Or do you just want me to talk to her? And she's like, no, no, no. Give her the real truth. I'm like, okay. And I sat her down and she was the bright eyed and pushy tail. This is right before she got into, she, before she hit the streets, if you will. Yeah. Um, um, she's, she's been in the business now about six, seven months. So you could, the shine is off the glitch. <laughs> It's she's she has already been beaten like she was out on location working in, in production in um, art department and then the director ran off with the money and they're all left out there with no money to pay the bills and they like oh have to drive God. home and she's like and she took turned down other jobs like this is she's already she's already going through the ringer a bit um, yeah. and I told her when I sat down with her and I told her I'm going to be really really frank and honest with you and I don't want you to take this the wrong way but I would rather you hear this from me then go through pain. Um, whether you like it or not, unfortunately, you are going to have to be about 100 to 200% better at your job to match up with a man at the same job who's 300% less than you. That's the starting point. Uh, and it's unfortunate, 
but yeah. it's the reality of, of, and I've seen it on my sets, which I try to always yeah. do it. I'm like, why is this dude here? She's much better. <laughs> or that other dude's much better. Like, why are you right. here? Uh, right. So on my sets, I always try to make it as, you know, I try to employ as best I can, whoever, whoever I can. But and she was just like her eyes open up. I'm like, I want you to understand. And I go, and by the way, that's not this industry. That's basically the world, unfortunately. And I look at this because I have two daughters. Yeah. I, and I'm going to have that same conversation with them when they're of age. And going to go, guys, this is what it is. But yeah, doesn't mean that there's other ways of going around it. But go ahead. Right. Well, that's what I want to say is that so. So what I, I had. um I'd been a, an activist in the women in film space for a while before writing this book. So I kind of thought, you know, I, I knew, I knew what there was to say, but, but I did these hundred interviews. I pulled thousands of pages of data and research and scholarly papers and sort of laid that all and like really looked at the whole situation. And there were a number of things that really knocked even me to my knees all over again, researching this book. And one of them is that I was looking at this Oscar data, right? So only five women have ever been nominated for Best Director Oscar in 92 years of the Oscars. Um, and only three of them have been in the last 25 years. So, Jesus. I mean, <laughs> so, so, I laugh, but it's not funny. But it's no, just like, it's, not, it's I mean, ridiculous. It, it, it's, it's ridiculous. It's absurd. So it's Sophia Coppola, mm -hmm. um, Catherine Bigelow, and Greta Gerwig. Mm -hmm. And so... Then I was thinking, okay, well, like, how did they do it, right? Were they, was it just that they were a thousand percent better than everybody else? Like, like, what is the thing that they have in common? How did they actually manage to do that? Well, they're all white, straight, cis, able-bodied women, for one mm -hmm. thing. But then I was looking and I was like, okay, but what's the real connector is that every single one of them is either the daughter or the romantic partner of a man who had already been nominated for an Oscar by the time they were nominated for an Oscar. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I just, when you so, said that, I, I connected the dots. I know who <laughs> each person is. I'm like, so yeah. Mm. Coppola, Francis Ford Coppola. It James helps Cameron. if he's a living icon. That's good. Um, yeah, James Cameron, another living icon. James Cameron, Catherine Bigelow, and Greta Gerwig, Noah Baumbach. Now, these are all very incredibly talented women also, right? I'm not taking Oh, of course. Of course. But what that means is that in the last 25 years, if you have been incredibly talented and ambitious and white, straight, cis, able-bodied, have all of the privilege, but you are not also directly related to a man who has already been nominated for an Oscar, it is not more difficult for you to reach that peak in your career. It has been literally impossible. And so that is the thing that I want women to understand is that if you play by their rules, you will lose. Of course, because it's stacked against not, you. Of course. Because they're rigged against you. Like, it's not, because I think there's a feeling sometimes like, well, but if I just keep my head down and I don't say anything and I don't complain, like, yes, it's only 5%, but I could be one of the 5%. It's a lottery ticket. And what I want people to understand is there is no woman who has, or person of color, who has ever had the career they would have if they were a white man. There's nobody. And so then the only option, the only reasonable option is to invent something else. So what you're trying to say is just pay the minimum due on your credit card and everything will be fine, right? You don't have to <laughs> pay off. Just pay the minimum payment and it'll all work out. Yeah. <laughs> it's the equivalent. Good, good advice for life. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Just charge it up to the top and pay your minimum. <laughs> That's what they say. And if you play by that rule, those rules, you'll be okay. You'll be fine. Um, it's, it's the equivalent of it. I actually, um, I knew a couple of, uh, crew members from point break and I was talking to them about, I'm like, what was it like, you know, work, working with Catherine and this and that. And, and they were telling me, frankly, that like she had the roughest time ever on point break because James wasn't there every day. James was off doing what James does, but James produced that. And if he wouldn't have produced it, she wouldn't have gotten the opportunity. That's, Regard and Catherine Bigelow is probably one of the best action directors of all time. Of course. There's no question. Um, and there's she should be directing a lot more than she has, even That's now. Right. That's even, right. Even so now. To point, if nobody's had the career she the, a man would have, like if Catherine Bigelow had testicles, like what is the career she would be having? She'd be Michael be Bay. Bigger. She'd be Michael Bay. She'd yeah. be really Scott. There's no question about it. Because yeah. she's she you I mean Look, look at Point Break and you look at that, just just Point Break. And then you look at Strange Days and Stranger Days and other action movies that she did in, in, in her career. Um, she's she's remarkable. She's better than most men. 
that yeah. I've seen. They're much better than most big Hollywood directing men uh, that I've seen. Uh, but uh, she was having a really, really, really rough time. There was no respect. And this was like 90. So they shot that in like 89. So you could only imagine a female director on an action movie, on a studio, a production. If it wasn't James, I mean, honestly, without James Cameron signing on, she just wouldn't have gotten it. Right. And then also James Cameron did the next movie with her. So James Cameron basically opened the door. She was Don, he was Donnie Brasco. He was like, right. she's a good fella. <laughs> <laughs> have her yeah. come in she's right. basically right. what it was and then coppola did the same thing for sophia again not taking anything away from their talents but it didn't hurt to get it well, it got well, them in the door it, it got it them in the door and it was impossible without that is my point like yeah. you can be as talented as Catherine bigelow and if james cameron as a white man doesn't say like hey she's she's okay i'll back her i'll back her then you still won't have that career without question and i didn't know all three of them had i'd never thought of it that way isn't that bananas all three of them yes. um and in the scope of thing Noah bachman is a, a fantastic filmmaker but he doesn't have the push or pull in town that james cameron or <laughs> for no. coppola did no, uh, no. you know at all but even then it's still something and I, I, I it's it's fascinating it's fascinating that's why like someone like robert rodriguez he snuck in the door and the person who let him in was his agent, who happened to be the most mm. powerful directing agent in Hollywood and brought this 23-year-old in. And he's the one mm. that said, guys, guys, you got to check this out. Hey, yeah, guys. Yeah. And then I think he also brought in Singleton. Mm. You know? and, and then that started that whole ball rolling. Um, there's always someone, if you're going to play this game, you need someone to get you at the door and open that door for you. It's, you have to do something so astronomical so revolutionary to get the notice of the system outside of this kind of, you know, Donnie Brasco world. But then also win the lottery. Like you have to- <laughs> And also win the lottery. <laughs> like why would you, like don't play that game. So that's what I've been, I've been preaching for the longest time because I, I, I chased that dragon for uh, 20 years trying <laughs> to make my first feature. I'm like, oh, I'm going to do this. I, I played all the games. I shot, I shot my feature. I shot my short. I had a business proposal. I had the PPM. I did an animated short, uh, you know, the pre-order story. Like I created this entire IP and yeah. I went out to town. I met a bunch of people, had actresses attacked, actors. And, my, and of course, for whatever reason, most of, I think every single one of my films has had a female lead in it. I don't know why, but every single movie I've made, including my two features, have a female lead in it. And it wasn't it wasn't conscious. I always just said, well, that's just more interesting. Well, <laughs> probably because you, you spend your life surrounded by women. It's probably yeah. if we're going to go deep into this, Mr. Freud, uh, Miss <laughs> Freud. Uh, I was, no, but but it's so I, I mean, I've I created this whole empire and I remember I still remember going into these meetings with these guys and they looked at this this action short that I directed and this. Japanese animated prequel. I had a comic book. I had all this stuff that I created for it. And they looked at me and said, like, yeah, can we make the, the lead a guy? Because just can't make a female action. Females can't, you know, helm yeah. an action movie. And this was 2011, 12, 13? Yeah. No, no. In 2011 and 12, when I was trying to make my first film, which was about two women, heaven for fend, everybody... With, with no every explosions. Meeting, with no, every meeting we went with, into. With no explosions. No explosions. Not even one. <laughs> uh, right. So it's not just the female action problem. It's just sort of the woman, the woman problem in general. Uh, that every single meeting we went into, they'd say, well, you, you can't make a film about two women. Who, who would watch that? It's like, I don't know, the 51% of the population that is women <laughs> are women, maybe? And like some men, presumably? I actually, so my last film I made was called On the Corner of Ego and Desire, which was a, a film about uh, filmmakers trying to sell their movie at the Sundance Film Festival. While the festival was going on, I, I completely guerrilla the entire movie. And I, and we've all seen the great uh, movies about making movies, uh, you know, The Player and uh, Living in Oblivion and all this stuff. But I had never seen a female director in the lead role. I've never yeah. seen it. So I decided to make my director, who happens to be, uh, her name's Sophia, um, Sonia O'Hara. Sonia O'Hara, I know her. So Sonia, Sonia is the, right. yeah. she was, she was amazing in the part. Yeah. She's a psychotic in the movie. Like you want to, <laughs> you want to wring her neck sometimes with the things she said in the, as a character. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, you're genius. Um, but that movie wouldn't be the same if I would have put, which originally was going to be a male, 
But when I saw Sonia, I'm like, oh no, you're 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 the director. I have to have you yeah. as the director because it's so much more interesting. Um, yeah. And I was like, I'd never seen it. I just thought about it, like I'd never seen a female yeah. director portrayed on cinema. Period. I think in the I, I don't know if in the history of cinema has there ever been a female director. There might be. I've never seen it, and definitely not out of the Hollywood system. Even in the no. olden days, there was never because that was just not a thing. So well, then women might start getting ideas that they could be directors. Stop it. It's very dangerous. That's a very dangerous thing. You don't want you don't want the women and the ethnics. Um, yeah. <laughs> To get, getting idea. ideas above their station. <laughs> and again, I, and I want to be very clear, and I think you've been clear about this as well. Um, there's nothing wrong with being a white male. It, no. it, and there's nothing wrong with white male films. Um, there's nothing wrong with a male perspective. There's nothing wrong with a female perspective. Nothing wrong with a Latino or Asian perspective. I mean, crazy, crazy rich Asians, that's a fairly Asian perspective. Yeah. And it was a huge, huge monstrous hit. Um, it's it's fine. It's just trying to balance it all out a bit more right. well, to to kind of represent society. Right. That's my point. Like it's it's so unreasonable right now. It's so like the fact that thirty percent is taking up ninety five percent of of the the jobs and the content creation just like at a very basic level makes no sense. And um, I lost my train of thought. So a second. Um, so. Do you find that the system in general is built to be kind of predatory in the sense? Oh, definitely. <laughs> you didn't even hint. Yeah. You didn't even slow down on that no, one. No. Definitely. Two I, women I, of women. Two women and two to women specifically, but to newcomers yeah. in general. Like oh, it, definitely. It, it's about yeah. it's about eating them up and spitting them out and just absorb like kind of like almost leeching off of whatever talent or skill they have. And for you to kind of break through that and actually make a name for yourself in the business is is a miracle. For a woman, it's just like basically the second coming. Right. <laughs> I mean right. yeah. and, and, and and the thing the is that as I can, I can literally count on one, one or two hands how many Latino directors of name recognition there are in our industry. Um, with one hand, I could do Asian. Um, with one or two hands, I could do African American. With women, definitely one. Yep. You know, it, that's that seems to be a problem. It, 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 I mean, I'm just saying that seems to be a problem. And again, I'm I, nothing against the the you know white males, but. We don't live in a in a in a country or in a, specifically in the U.S. that is seventy percent white male, you know. Like well, and like your lives would you white men your lives would be better also with no this. Of course, I, different I, perspectives. I, absolutely, I guarantee. Like a, the content would be more interesting, so sure. that would be better. Mm -hmm. And b, like part of what makes our industry so toxic is this, is that it's all of the people are the same too. And they've whipped up this sort of like penis war, toxic masculinity tornado that lies at the core of our industry. And like, it doesn't have to be this awful people, you know, I'm like so, I'm sorry. stories. Can we, can we just back that up for a second? Did you just say penis tornado? That's, I think I, think I said penis war, toxic masculinity tornado. <laughs> But let's go back to the penis tornado. I think that is a, and I think that's a sequel to Sharknado. I'm thinking it could the penis, be the penis tornado, <laughs> and it should be directed by a woman. I'm just saying. Let's throw that out there right now. Anyone listening, take it. It's free. No IP. Free idea. Yeah. Free idea. Go make millions. Go make millions with it. Let us know. <laughs> Give us a special thanks. Uh, <laughs> the, the the other thing I was going to say, and, and again, I'm going to uh, go back to my daughters with this is, this is the system. This is the realities of this system. Um, and what I was saying before, when I, uh, when I was chasing my own dream of being a, you know, doing my own feature and stuff like that and playing by the system, by the rules of the system that you have to do this, 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 and this, and I did everything right and still couldn't break through. I just said to myself, I'm tired of playing by their rules. I'm going to create my own rules and I'm going to do my own thing. And the second I made that switch in my mind, my entire world changed and I became much more free as not only an artist, but as a businessman and, yeah. and being able to provide for my family and being able to express myself as an artist and to cast whoever the hell I wanted to cast. And, you know, I keep my budgets really low to do what I want to do to have more freedom to do that. But I would tell my girls growing up, I would say, 
if you don't like the rules of the game of the sandbox you're trying to play in, then go play in another sandbox or better yet, go build your own sandbox yep. and play your own game. And I promise you the kids at the other sandbox will eventually start knocking on your door. And if, yeah. it, if they don't, it doesn't matter because you're having you're a, a better sandbox. You're, you're going to be doing your thing. And that's exactly what's happened with me in, in my career where I started to build my own sandbox. And now people from that other sandbox have been knocking and they're like, Hey, yeah. how can we do this? Hey, how can we do that? Um, and, and that's, I think that's the goal. I think that's the, the only way to do it because, you know, maybe you and I are both a little bit, um, uh, a little too much shrapnel in us from the business, um, you know, and and we just know the realities of, of the business. I'm curious to see what's going to happen again at the end of this whole thing with the with, with this and see what, yeah. because if if things were tough when things were good, meaning like if things were tough for people of color and, and women when money was plentiful, when all that yeah. tightens down, oh yeah, I don't see a lot of, opportunity in the system for those stories they're gonna they're gonna just go straight down to what they know yeah we're, totally. we're, we're gonna do another john claude van damme meets steven seagal meets mike tyson and yep. that's gonna be sold and that's right. yeah that's it. and right and they're gonna go yeah and all those these conversations we've been having since me too and oscar's so white and like yeah, yeah yeah but like now now we need to get down to the real business and like we we don't have space for those conversations anymore and like we just need to get back to the the white dudes um <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but again, like I said at the beginning, this is our moment. Like they're weak, right? They've been hit. They, <laughs> they are, they're the Hydra. They're absolutely going to double down on their old thing, but their old thing doesn't work anymore anyway. And like, this, uh, this is the, this is the opportunity for something else. I want, I want to, there's a moment in, in our history in, in the film industry that this happened. Uh, this has happened a few times, but very, not like this, but where there's a weakness in the system. Um, it happened in the 70s when they the Hollywood system had no idea what to do. They had no idea how to make youthful films. They saw a movie called Easy Rider show up and just blow them out of the water while they're making Finland's dancing whatever <laughs> you know thing that uh, Coppola did um he directed this thing in the, like 1970 it was like and nobody went to go see it or or Heaven's Gate or these kind of movies and and they were like what do we do well let's let's let these kids in and because of that moment that window of opportunity we've got you know again some of the great cinema of of I mean the 70s is amazing cinema so yeah. Spielberg Scorsese Milius um, you know, Coppola, all those kind of guys, they got opportunities that would have never, ever gotten in the system. Like Spielberg would have never been able to walk in to the 40s and the 50s. It just, he wouldn't have been given that opportunity. It would have been very difficult for him. Um, and I know these are all still white males, um, but we're talking about that time in history. Yeah, but, yeah. That, but that opened up an opportunity for that. And then it happened again in the 90s. The, the Sundance generation, the Tarantinos, right. the Robert Rodriguez's, the Spike Lee's, the John Singleton's, the Richard Linklater's uh, of the world. Um, and that group was that small window right. um, to get those opportunities. Um, then there was another window with um, commercial directors when the Finchers and the Bays and the Antoine mm. Fuqua's came in uh, as well. But you've noticed every single time I've said any of these movements, there's no women and <laughs> no women no, being no. spoken well, about. Well, that would be radical i mean we're talking about at least people of color um so there's yeah. some there's some movement uh, like progressively more of those with what, each. yeah we yeah. get we're getting there but um but this is going to be that for for god yeah. knows what else you know i mean i always i always tell people like you know imagine fast and furious it was if it was you know the dirty dozen it'd be pretty boring <laughs> meaning that like it was just all white dudes yeah. You know, that's one of the things that make that film so well, that whole franchise so well received. It's that there is such a multicultural yeah. and, and, and everything is in there um, moving. I don't, I don't know. It's a very, it's a very tough topic to talk about. And I really am glad that you came on. I'm, first of all, I'm, I'm so glad you wrote this book and I want to ask you, what do you, th what is your hope for this book? What is your hope that this book does for people? Well, so it's only, again, it's only been out about a month and a half. And already I feel like a lot of the things that I most wanted to accomplish with it, I've heard are happening. So one, one thing is I'm getting a lot of emails from women 
some of them, you know, from <clears throat> high school all the way up to have been in the industry for three decades writing and saying like, oh, I didn't understand what we were dealing with before and now I do and I'm never going to approach my career the same way again. Um, so that's, so that's, <laughs> that's very exciting, right? Awesome. So it's like, it's like breaking them out of the matrix. Um, I've gotten a lot of emails from, <laughs> from white men who have said, Hey, I didn't, I didn't understand, like, I kind of got it, but I didn't really know. And like, now you gave me tools to actually be part of the solution. And mm -hmm. I'm And now like, I'm going to change my behavior going forward. Um, but I have actually gotten a huge response from film schools. We'll see if they if they program it, but so far there's been a really excited response about the idea of using it as a tool in film schools. And one of the major streaming networks that I can't name read the book and bought a copy for every member of their content staff um, to help mm -hmm. them understand how they were contributing to this problem. So that's... Wow. Very that's yeah. very so look it's it's books have a very amazing power um yeah. there you know i've been I've, been, I've written a couple books and books will go to places you will not even know about and, yeah. and it will affect people in ways that you will never know and never see i mean just the same way as i read i read a couple books a week and i try to absorb and they i mean they've changed my life they've changed my perspective they changed, yeah. to change the way i think about things and when you write a book and you have that effect on other people, yeah. it's um, it's it's pretty amazing. It's a it's it a is. pretty amazing experience. I got a, I had a school call me up and like we'd like to buy in bulk. I'm like bulk, um, yeah. okay. Uh, yeah. Let me set that right up for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. How, how, how many do you want? And you know it's like, yeah. I'm like I guess we're selling in bulk now. So yeah. uh, you know there were there were people that were excited about my latest book. And, and I've just the reviews and the people come back to you, like you said, they, they come back to you with these things. Like you've changed the way I think about making movies and moving yeah. forward. And it's, it's very gratifying. It's very gratifying. It's so gratifying. And it's, it's so exciting. And I think like what I would say to people who are like, eh, maybe I'll read this book. Maybe I won't like, you don't understand <laughs> Like, even if you've read articles and you know the numbers and you've listened to this interview and like you kind of have a vague understanding that this is a problem, the thing that you can do in a book that you can't really do in any other format is pulling together a hundred interviews, pulling together thousands of pages of data, overlaying the human stories with the numbers and the percentages. And everybody who's read the book has said, like, I didn't really know until I sat down and read this cover to cover and like saw the scope of it and like actually understood. So, and, and I think once you do, you can't ever move forward or watch film the same way ever again. Oh no. I mean, I, without question, without question, you look at, you're like the perspective of what, you know, I grew up in the, the, the eighties, essentially eighties and nineties, you know, coming up and all I saw was what you said, you know, movies made by basically white males that's why when she's got a habit showed up, everyone was like, "What? What? <laughs> like, what is this? You know?" Or even better, um, Hollywood Shuffle. Do you mm -hmm. remember? Do you remember Hollywood Shuffle? No, I think I'm, I'm, uh, I missed uh, that slightly. So Robert, so just, so I, I want Robert on this. Robert Townsend. You remember Robert Townsend, the actor? Okay, uh, so Robert yeah. Townsend. <laughs> so Robert Townsend was so upset about all the parts he was going out for in Hollywood. That he was just like, you know, he was the gang member, he was the this, you know, he was the drug dealer, he was the drug addict, he was like, you know, the butler, he was like, th th those, th he was so ridiculous, yeah. so he's like, you know what, I'm gonna make a movie about that. And he made Hollywood Shuffle, which was, mm. it was made in 1987, it was the, it was the first time, to my knowledge, filmmakers, at least at a grand scale, fil a filmmaker put everything on his credit cards. So he spent he spent like thirty forty thousand dollars fifty thousand dollars on his credit cards and made this movie on film back in the day you know he made the whole thing and it went on to gross like ten fifteen million dollars mm. and it was all about how like how to there was a white acting coach telling a black actor how to talk black <laughs> it's hilarious like no man you see you gotta do it like the more bait like and like and he's like and you see yeah, the and, yeah. and the black actor speaking very. Well, it's really okay. I'm I'm from Juilliard, and this, it was just 
<laughs> so brilliantly. The satire was fantastic uh, yeah. on how he did it. So um, when these kind of films showed up, people were just like, and when, when El Mariachi showed up and Desperado showed up on, on Robert Rodriguez's side, it, it's, it was amazing. And I was, I was remembering, well, even Sofia Coppola with Virgin Suicides, like yeah. that was just like, how it, it's just so, it's jarring. It's like, you don't know until you know, until you see it. You don't like, realize you're in the matrix until you, I, I had a, a, a 60 year old, 60 ish year old African-American woman come up to me um, after a talk. And she said to, she said, when I watched queen sugar, mm -hmm. she said, that is the first time in my whole life that I ever saw my family and myself on screen. And she said, in that moment, I suddenly realized that that is what white men experience every time they watch a movie. And she was 60 years old. Wow. Yeah. And, and that's, that is shameful. It is without, without question. And, you know, whether you love him or not, Tyler Perry, what he's been able to do, you know, with his, with his work, he's, he saw like no one saw themselves up there. Yeah. And yeah. I'd argue to say that Latinos are still struggling with that. There's not oh, a lot absolutely. of, there's not a lot of, you know, there is more. Yeah. There is more. We, hey, we had JLo, JLo and Shakira on the Super Bowl. What more do we want? I mean, seriously. I, mean, <laughs> I know. Stop complaining. I mean, come on. It's, I, mean, I, come. I had a, a white, <laughs> an older white gentleman on Twitter the other day say, he, well, I, I had made reference to the fact that women are half of the population. And so he first corrected me and said, women are actually 51% of the population. And um, also, it's getting very exhausting listening to women complain all the time. <laughs> And I said, sir, not as exhausting as it is to have to complain all of the time. Um, so I'm going to ask you one last question. Um, okay. What advice would you give uh, a female filmmaker wanting to break into this business today? Um, read my book before you step out of the door. I say the same thing. Two. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> And also read Alex's book. Um, <laughs> and two, uh, it is your civic, moral, and ethical responsibility to make sure that you find a way to tell your stories and get them out to audiences who desperately need to see them and want to see them. And if the system wor works for you, great. But never, ever allow them to determine your worth because you have to understand that the system is fundamentally not set up to recognize your worth or your voice. So if it does not work for you and they do not give you value, you have to make your own and you have to find ways around and tell it. Please, please find a way to tell your stories because we need them. I can't have said it better myself. That is a <laughs> great way to end the show. Um, can you tell everybody where they can find your book? Absolutely. The Wrong Kind of Women Inside Our Revolution to Dismantle the Gods of Hollywood is available in hardcover, audiobook, and ebook wherever books are sold. Um, it's such a great title. That's such a, <laughs> such a just in your face title. I love it. I love well, it. I love it. There's a headless Oscar on the cover. And this, there's <laughs> you, that's a real benefit of buying the hard cover is that you get to have this book on your shelf with a decapitated Oscar on the cover. <laughs> <laughs> Naomi, and, and, uh, and then where can people watch uh, bite me on, uh, Amazon, iTunes and Google play at the moment. At the moment, and hopefully other places coming other soon. Places. Yeah. Naomi, thank you so much for taking a time out of your quarantine um, to um, to speak uh, to very speak busy with me. Quarantine. Yes, you're thank very you. busy. <laughs> no, thank, thank you for you doing so much it. For having me back. Yes, and thank you for doing the the work you're doing, and 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 hopefully this episode will shine some light on it and uh, open some minds and help uh, help some filmmakers, regardless of of race or um, gender to be able to tell stories that they want to tell within the system or preferably without outside the system. I, it's just more fun being outside the party. It's I just, way more fun. <laughs> a very Thank bad party. <laughs> Thanks again. Thank you.